Greg our computer to the rescue. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Are you able to pull up the um, Zoom machine? Too? Yeah. Um, Sorry. What? They're, they're all set. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yep. Yeah, well, it's a little awkward transition for them, but. It's better than I'm expecting. So, oh, yeah, sorry, so we'll I should have worn that. Yeah, oh, you're good. Do you have the sign in information? Um, I would just open your email and like click that link, and then we'll just have your computer share. Yeah, yeah. and we're also here. Um, yeah, you can hear us. Rita, can you confirm that you can hear us? I can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, thanks, man. Between the two of us. It only and, takes and eight Brad. of us to use modern day technology, right? Gosh. Just a little bit of time. Thank you all for coming in. We're going to wait a few minutes for a few more people to get settled in, and then we're going to get going.
All right, everybody, thank you all very much for coming in today for our second subcommittee orientation. Uh, this is our second subcommittee meeting for the subcommittees of the, of the comprehensive plan update. So thank you all for taking the time over your lunch hour to come in for an hour and listen to potential themes for the overall comprehensive plan update. We have people on Zoom who will be able to um, ask any questions or raise their hands on Zoom, and we will address them as we go. And then everybody else here in the audience, if you do have a question, I will be repeating it into the microphone for our friends online. And with that, we will dive into our three themes that we are going to cover here today. The overarching themes for the comprehensive plan as proposed in the initial request for proposals and confirmed by the city council are equity, technology, and sustainability. These are overarching themes that are intended to affect all areas of the comprehensive plan. So in the last orientation session, we covered the 12 subcommittee sections of the comprehensive plan update. And, this time, and those 12 sections will have these three themes running throughout them. Our goal is to make sure that the consideration of these three themes are at the forefront in the subcommittee process. We'll be asking questions like, how do the goals and objectives recommended by each subcommittee incorporate these themes? The facilitators for the individual subcommittees will be responsible for making sure that these three themes are addressed if it doesn't become part of the natural conversation of the subcommittee. We'll begin with equity. The equity definition that we're operating under is that we are providing viable options and opportunities to help people reach their full potential. This will take many different shapes and forms in our different subcommittees. Some of the examples on the board are already, are already elements that we have heard from the, uh, from the public through the phase one and phase two engagement, including increased housing choice, improving accessibility to public parks and facilities, and reaching out to underrepresented populations for participation in city government. This can include a broad range of different people within our, within our community here in Winona. This could be based on age, gender, sexual orientation, physical and mental ability, language, income, education, religious or ethical values. And I encourage you to also think about the regular practices of the city of Winona. For example, do we reach out to renters enough? Do we reach out to those who, or do we overrepresent those who are homeowners, for example? We need to make sure that all of our policies are actually being reflective of those who live in our community, not just reflective of the status quo. Another important element to consider is that we traditionally do a lot of planning. It's easy to be hung up on planning for the here and now. We need to plan for people who are currently here as well as people that are coming to Winona. Some other examples of typically excluded groups can include immigrants and refugees, which was a recent hot topic at the city council, minority religious groups, older adults, women, youth. All of these people have a vested interest in our community and want to be a part of our community, but may not traditionally have a voice in our process. We wanna make sure that we have plans in place for our city to be a place where residents can thrive regardless of where they come from, their background and race, income, age, ability, or where they live. We also wanna make sure that we address the inadequate access to goods, services, and access to information as well. We also wanna create a creative, inclusive community that is not segregated based on land use, based on income, based on background. Traditionally, the city of Winona has done a very good job of this, but we wanna make sure that we can improve as we go forward. We need to identify the resources, investments, changes, and in policies that would promote further equity in our community. One approach that is coming across the state of Minnesota, which we intend to incorporate, would be the equitable, develop, or the equitable development scorecard. This has been utilized in other communities across the state of Minnesota, and the Government Alliance on Race and Equity is kind of driving this approach in other cities. This would be looking at equitable community engagement practices, who are we reaching out to, to be parts of our processes? How are we reaching out to them? How are we determining who is the right person at that table? 
equitable housing practices? Do we have enough housing choice for those across all income segments to be able to be housed in our community? Do they have access to the right resources to make that housing affordable and feasible for them? Do we have equitable environmental practices? Do we have the ability for our, do we have the ability for our community members to enjoy the natural resources and recreation opportunities that are so important to Winona's identity? And then equitable access to economic development and land use practices. Do we have segregated land use practices? Do we, can we improve that in some manner? How do we make sure that as we move forward, we're planning for all people to be welcome in our community? And equitable transportation. We oftentimes think about ourselves of how we can go from one place to another, and we all at some point are going to be pedestrians in that, in that endeavor. We wanna make sure that everybody, regardless of how they walk, roll, or drive, are getting to their place. These equitable principles that we're going to cover will be equitable community engagement practices, which will involve the community members most affected. So right now it can be difficult to reach out and ensure that people who might be affected by a new housing, housing policy or might be affected by a new housing development have a, have a seat at the table, for example. We wanna make sure that we're going to where those people are and that we have the right resources for them to take time out of their day to contribute and be a part of our, our community and the decision-making process. Building into that, the equitable housing practices, we need to consider households of all income levels, not just hearing from the typical respondents in our community to make sure that housing is going to be somewhat more affordable or more affordable or considerably more affordable in our community. That'll mean housing choice and making sure that we have considerable development to lower the overall cost. And equitable environmental practices, we wanna make sure that we are having balanced development that also is uh, taking into consideration the environmental concerns and desires of our community. As you all are aware, because you all live here, we have beautiful bluffs, great topography, and we're surrounded by vast water resources. The city of Winona and its residents have made it very clear that this is important for us as we consider future growth. As we look at the economic development and land use practices, we also need to make sure that people can get to the jobs that draw people to our community. While it's great to focus on recreation and the beautiful quality of life that we have in our community, we don't, we don't always have the economic, or excuse me, we also need economic drivers to bring people into our community. We need to make sure that people can get to their jobs. We need to make sure that people have the ability to live here so that they're able to actually get there without needing to take into account a housing and transportation index, which is if more than 40% of your personal income will prohibit you from living in our community. And when them tying in right into that, the equitable transportation practices, how can we incorporate a range of transportation modes and a transportation network Excuse me, that actually drives people to those destinations, whether it's a recreation destination, an economic destination, or just their house. With that, I'm gonna take a pause and see if anybody has any questions related to equity. Seeing no comments from the people in person and not seeing any comments online, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Miller of HKGI. He is one of the lead consultants for this got project. A oh, go right ahead, Nick. Um. So I don't know how to say this other than just kind of blurt it out. This sounds like a pretty lofty uh, goal. Um, I'm not saying it's not noble or correct. I'm just saying um, to what degree um, is council or the city uh, committed to <clears throat> seeing this through to its um, stated end here? Uh, to what degree will the city become involved or does the want a city the council of the city want to be a player in in the private market in order to drive in some cases some of the things you're talking about it just seems um <clears throat> like we'll be asked to do some version of that and then when you start to get in the shades of gray um there can be a difference of opinion about how faithful you stay stay to these principles um and how much you uh kind of negotiate down from there? That's a really good question. And this time I do want to state that the comprehensive plan is a really high level look at the overall direction of the community. While the subcommittees are going to be creating goals, objectives, and strategies to address the different elements within their subcommittee focus areas, it will be up to the political will of our community to take action going forward. This is just setting a general direction. Future studies, future policies will have to go before the respective governing boards that are appointed by the city council and to the city council themselves. 
So while, while that's not a perfect answer to that question, uh, the idea is that we're setting a general direction that everybody feels on board with. And as a note, these three themes did go before city council before we issued the request for proposals for this project. And they've gone, they've gone before them when we did receive the proposals for this project and chose HKGI, our lead consultants as well. Any other questions? All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Miller, who I was in the middle of introducing. He is one of our lead consultants here with HKGI, and he'll be able to talk to you about the overarching theme of technology. Thanks, Luke. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Um, I was just gonna add on to uh, your response to that question. Um, HKGI does work on a lot of comprehensive plans. So we know from our experience that incorporating topics like equity, especially, but also technology and sustainability are, they're on, a, they're emer emerging topics. So they're not traditionally covered in comprehensive plans. So, you know, any city that's taking on these topics in their comp plans are, you know, I would say in the forefront. So there's a lot to learn about each of the topics and how they get addressed at the high level. And then as Luke said, at the decision-making level and in the other committees. So, um, so technology uh, is like equity. There's a lot to learn. There's a big learning curve for all of us, um, including us planners who are presenting today. So uh, the intent is to weave the overarching themes into all the 12 topics of the comprehensive plan. So for technology, that means incorporating um, innovation into how the city operates to make services more effective, efficient, and accessible. Uh, there's some examples on the slide that deal with you know, how this uh, city property is maintained and operated, how city departments uh, might have new equipment or software to be more efficient, and how they work with the community, and then city meetings and having more online options and interactive options that work for people. And you know, we're, what we're finding, especially with the pandemic, is works with people's time and ability to get to things. So that, you know, actually a lot of these technology options and online options are more flexible because you don't have to be at a certain time, at a place at a certain time that doesn't work for everybody. Uh, so impacts on cities of technology, as we all know, there's this, you know, it's unbelievable how much technology is out there and the pace of it. And uh, the impacts on cities, I think, are still not widely known. You know, a lot of information at a basic level is becoming or has become digitized. So that's one way of how it impacts cities. Just so much information is coming out that way. And then processes um, are getting digitalized. So we all know that, uh, you know, we're ordering takeout from restaurants, as an example, or we're doing this meeting virtually, some of us. Um, schools have had, you know, virtual options. Where we work, maybe we work from home or maybe we work in the office. There's just lots of things that have changed and become, have a digital aspect to them. Next slide. So one of the, one of the topics out there that relates to cities and then technologies and how they interact is uh, the concept of smart cities kind of three ways to think about smart cities are um, three pieces of it are gov tech or government tech, which is the use of technology to increase the efficiency of cities operations and services. So, you know, what is the city doing and how are they using technology? Civic tech is more about civil, um, in civic engagement. So using technology for that and making things more accessible to residents and vice versa. And then another way to think about it is urban tech, um, the use of technology to improve the urban environment and an infrastructure that works better for residents, businesses, and government. And I'm sorry, there's an acronym at the top of the slide, APA, that stands for American Planning Association, which is a, a resource for this topic and for the planners in the room. So what are the opportunities for cities as far as technology? Um, 
So there's this idea of transforming over time to be smart cities or smarter cities. And that's really inspired by the idea of smart technology and smartphones, which a lot of us are um, using on a very frequent basis. So uh, it's using digital technologies to transform how cities coordinate processes and share information. Uh, technologies that improve the quality of city services and the user friendliness of processes and city communication in general. Also how data is collected and used and then how that's used to de develop implementation strategies. Some of the challenges as a lot of us have heard about there is the digital divide. So high speed broadband internet services are not available to everyone. Um, I can say myself, when I started working at home uh, during the pandemic, I had some major internet problems and had to go to getting cable connected to my house. And I had that option and, you know, income comes into play. So, you know, we can't assume that everybody has great internet access. Uh, electronic devices aren't always affordable for everybody. That's another challenge. Uh, getting access to information on smartphones is another good approach to think about. A lot of people get a lot of their information through their smartphones. And if the information isn't set up uh, as well on smartphones as it is on computers, including city websites and city, you know, say permitting applications and that sort of thing, uh, it may not work for a lot of people. And then also access to digital payment methods. Not, not everybody has you know, uh, easy access to a credit card, for example. Next slide. So some examples of technology that are uh, really relevant to cities are this idea called citizen relationship management. Um, people that work in business may be more familiar with CRM or customer relationship management. It's the idea of using technology to improve a company's or a city's relationship with its clients or residents. Uh, the idea is that people are able to easily share and access city information, that that's a priority. And that it's, people are able to easily report issues to the city as well. Other examples are uh, the idea of open data access or portals, which could be um, data, all the data like crime data that could be mapped. So you could see you know, where crime's happening in, in Winona, which neighborhoods, which streets, um, mapping in general, uh, you know, access to parks could be mapped, trail connections, uh, anything you can think of. That if you go to, there's some cities in Minnesota that you can go to to see some of these examples. Um, I know many, Minneapolis and St. Paul have these uh, data access portals. Next slide. OpenGov is another online platform that's really focused on having financial transparency for, for residents. And so it focuses on things like the city's budget um, and capital improvement projects. Uh, automated online development applications. So when somebody wants to uh, apply for a, say a conditional use permit or a building permit, that that information gets submitted online digitally rather than having to write out a form and, and deliver it to the city. Uh, as I mentioned before, city apps on smartphones is another example. Uh, Real-time reporting and mapping of issues is another example. Could be like issues with train traffic in Winona or issues with street maintenance or park maintenance. Like those could be digitally handled so that everybody's kind of aware of them. The information gets from individual residents to the, the appropriate city uh, employee or department quickly. Next slide, please. Uh, things like smart street lights, uh, where you know the street lights react to when people are using those areas, those sidewalks, those parks. Um, there's also a part of st smart street lights where the sensors can also collect data, and then that data can be used to figure out the frequency that certain streets, sidewalks, crosswalks, parks are used so that uh, improvements can be made to address areas 
that are frequently used. Um, in, integrated smart water systems is another way, or another example, sorry. And then expanding the use of engaging digital public, I can move my people bar, uh, public input tools. So having uh, public input opportunity, opportunities accessible on your smartphone, uh, visualizing things. We've been trying to do concepts that uh, include 3D versions, things that are easier for people to understand. Sometimes planners or designers can have concepts that make sense to us, but to regular people, they, they don't really engage, engage you. Uh, and then being able to give feedback to those concepts. Next slide. That's it. So uh, I think we'll take another break and see if anybody has questions or comments relating to the topic of technology. Is there room for an individual who doesn't want to be digitized every which direction to function in our society? Because I'm not so keen on it. The question was, is there room for an individual who does not want to be digitized in every function of society as she is not too keen on it? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. I'm one of those people too. So um, yeah, uh, it's, it's difficult because I think just, there's a lot of things that are going that way. I know in our, our firm, we have really tried to focus on doing in-person um, interaction when possible. So, uh, you know, one of the things that came out of the pandemic, I think also is just the importance of people wanting to socialize and to be able to do it safely when things are not ideal, when there's a virus situation going on. So I think there is an increased focus on creating more public spaces, especially outside and in making those more accessible to people. So, um, I feel like if anything, we appreciate the in-person aspect of things more because of the pandemic, but it's, there's two prongs to that, the virtual aspect of it or digital part of it. Um, there's been a lot of improvements with that. And as I said, one of the advantages we've seen is that we feel like we've actually gotten more input having good virtual or online engagement opportunities in addition to in-person opportunities because of that fact that you don't have to be at a certain place at a certain time. Um, and, you know, a lot of times there's not options. What about the effects of 5G on health? There was a question related to the effects of 5G on health. And Jeff, I don't know if that's in your expertise, but we could address it in the actual subcommittees. That's, yeah, that's definitely not in my expertise. I have heard about that. and. I'm interested in that, but I, yeah, I can speak to that. Nick, it looks like you've raised your hand. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks. It strikes me that some of the topics that you talked about in this section would, you know, like say, for example, making city government more efficient with the use of technology. Um, so my question is, are we going to have access to city staff who can sort of explain the current systems that they have in place? Like, I know that we're supposed to be representing the needs of the community. And so I think I have a pretty good handle on that. But what we might not all have a handle on of what sort of technologies are in place. Does the city staff, for example, feel that they could use additional technology of one type or another to do their jobs more efficiently? And will we have access either to staff to relate those concerns? or some kind of polling or other, you know, bringing people in, asking them questions, that kind of thing. How, how will we kind of go about that as a subcommittee? Yeah, Nick, that is a really good question. There are at least two staff members assigned to help facilitate every subcommittee. So as those questions do arise, they will either be available to answer those questions or ready to schedule another staff member who can better answer those questions for the next meeting. So we anticipate a lot of back and forth and conversation around the multitude of topics for the comprehensive plan. We did have two questions come in in the chat and I believe that, or sorry, one question, Sadie, I believe that you just had a comment. Um, Rachel, do you want to unmute and ask your question or should I read it? Um, I can unmute. This is Rachel Stahl. Um, I'm just wondering about things like smart streetlights. Are there surveillance or privacy concerns? Like would 
there ever be technology where police would be automatically called if someone is in a public park after it's closed or things like that? Um, yeah, with, with a lot of technology there, yeah, there's always probably gonna be some privacy concerns to consider. Um, I haven't heard about that, that specific situation. Um, we're, we're actually just starting to get to know more about the uh, data part of it. Um, and there's, you know, there are companies that actually are really focused on helping cities capture that data and then figure out how to use it. So I think the uses of it that I'm aware of so far have not been focused on the crime aspect of it. It's been more focused on the um, having facilities be improved for areas where there are you know, traffic issues or I guess safety issues, so lighting. Um, yeah, so the answer is, yeah, there, there could be a privacy concern or consideration, but I haven't heard that talked about much yet with this new technology. Any other questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, sorry, I'm going to- Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike Hanson, I was muted. Uh, you know, while I, while I think that uh, coming from an economic development point of view, while I think the delivery of documentation and the um, uh, intent to develop, uh, I, I, I think it's great that we have portals for that. I can't tell you enough. Um, I work in the Port Authority. I can't tell you enough how much that, you know, one-to-one -one relationship, physical face-to-face -face relationship is so important um, for all kinds of reasons I could get into in detail, you know, at some further point, but um, there's an efficiency in delivering the documentation and there's a loss when you can't sit down face-to-face. Yeah, I don't. Just a comment. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would just respond that. I, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, and we're. Uh, I think the 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 inclusion of this theme of technology isn't to, and I don't want to speak for staff, is isn't to advocate that you know, Winona becomes the most tech savvy city in Minnesota. I think it's just being aware that there is a lot of technology out there and identifying where it's helpful and where maybe it's not important. Sure. All right, we're gonna move on. We are about halfway done with our total presentation. I'm going to introduce Rita Trapp, who is the co-lead from HKGI, and she's gonna to talk to you about the environmental sustainability. All right, thank you. I assume you can hear me. Just checking. Yes? Yes, we can, Rita. Okay, just checking since it's different to be online instead of in person with you. Uh, so the overarching theme of sustainability, you will note that this is uh, unique uh, compared to the other two because there are uh, kind of subcategories of environmental and fiscal. When we look at the um, sustainability, kind of the working definition that we've been using, um, you can see it's, it's creating a resilient city that is a desirable place for future generations to live, work and play. Um, so some examples as we provided them as a starting point uh, for thinking about this topic, uh, including providing uh, workforce housing, enhancing connectivity between key destinations, maintaining and enhancing natural environment, and then responsible stewardship of fiscal resources. So this presentation is going to be broken into, we'll talk about environmental sustainability first, and then fiscal sustainability second. It's not that they're not connected to each other, it's just helpful to kind of focus in on one element. Um, rather than interweaving them uh, throughout the presentation. So I'm gonna start with environmental first, partly because that's uh, really focusing on the natural resources. The city has a sustainability plan and this definition is coming from the sustainability plan and it's very focused on environmental as opposed to the fiscal side of it. Um, so sustainability is the ability to equitably meet the needs of the Winona community while preserving and reducing consumption of natural resources. So as to not compromise the ability of future generations and wildlife to do the same. 
Um, so you can see some of the same elements uh, from this definition that we already talked about in terms of making sure that we are planning for the future um, as we try and look um, at using the natural resources. When we look at uh, in Winona, we thought it was important to kind of set the stage. Um, as I say, in many of the communities I work in, there's just things that we visibly see that we don't actually necessarily recognize. And sometimes going through and talking about it from a, a map perspective and aerial perspective helps us understand the environment. Obviously, you can see the bluffs. We know about that, but there are also some other unique features that we wanted to highlight. Uh, one of those is that the city is really on a former sandbar that's separated from kind of the mainland or the bluff area um, from uh, a series of, of man-made channels as well as Lake Winona. So you can see this better on this graphic uh, where really the main part of the community um, is on a former sandbar and it's not uh, necessarily there's a limited amount and it's really surrounded by natural resources. Uh, the blue is the river um, and then the green is looking at different types of wetlands that are in the community. And then the blue are what are classified as lakes. Uh, the floodplain areas used to be more extensive, as you can imagine, over the years. Uh, we've used flood control structures to kind of modify and make sure that we can actually use the land and we can uh, travel throughout the community. Uh, there is the streams are highlighted in a kind of a bright blue color. And almost all of the streams that flow into the city are designated trout streams. Uh, one thing I should talk about the maps, we have kind of the main part of Winona in the large map, uh, and then there is a part of Winona that extends uh, south uh, towards the bluffs, and those are kind of in the inset on the bottom right. It's just not possible to have a good view of Winona if we put everything on the map at the same time. Um, so that was kind of how we adjusted it. I'm, as I said at the beginning, I'm sure you all know about the bluffs. There's great views, um, but it also makes uh, development very challenging, as you know. Uh, we have the roads and the subdivisions that go up into the bluffs. The city does have a bluff impact overlay district, and it's had it for a number of years. And the intention is to protect steep slopes and prevent significant erosion. Um, so that's something that we take into consideration as we talk about how do we look at land use and housing um, and other elements of development in the comprehensive plan, giving the economic or the environmental um, challenges uh, that we have and the constraints of the community. Relative to plant communities, uh, all tied into this, uh, the, plant, the community has a number of different types of uh, forests, different types of forests and prairie, and obviously um, the wetlands that we talked about, these green areas, uh, the darker green is uh, higher uh, quality biodiversity and significance in the community. These are all areas uh, where that are important to the community and you can see a lot of them are in the bluff areas. Um, and so we wanna keep that in mind as we look for new areas for development or as we talk about how we connect the different natural resources of the community um, as we look at parks and open space. Um, so this context is important to us. Um, the sustainability plan, which is some of the slides, the next slides that we have, took a look at a, a variety of different areas. They started with the natural resources like I just did, and then they also looked at some other um, elements of related to sustainability. The first one being energy. Um, energy consumption is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. You can see from the chart on the right, um, the commercial and the energy uh, industrial sector, which is the outer ring, you can see that they uh, consume 69% of all of the energy uh, and the residential doesn't consume as much, but there's a lot more users. So there's more individuals that we would need to deal with as we try and reduce energy consumption, uh, but they actually don't have as much impact as kind of the, the commercial and industrial sector. Um, in the center of the circle, before I move on, the center part of the circle shows the different types of sources of greenhouse gas emissions. So the large blue, uh, is energy, uh, the orange is transportation, and the smallest piece of the pie is waste. Um, and so we need to, as we look at reducing greenhouse gas emission, that kind of gives us a sense of where we might focus energies. Um, since 2016, according to the sustainability plan and what they had collected, um, electricity consumption has decreased, natural gas consumption has been relatively flat. So if you're interested in the sustainability topic, as we think about how it weaves uh, through the different Topics of the comprehensive plan, that, com that plan is a good resource for kind of understanding where things are at now and also some of the strategies that were recommended uh, in that plan. Moving on from 
Uh, just energy, if we look at transportation, remember that was the second largest piece of the pie. Um, and the transportation is another place where we can have an impact. Uh, vehicle miles travels has increased since 20, 2014. Um, the good news in some respects, depending on your perspective, in terms of equity, 86% of households have access to at least one vehicle. Um, not as maybe positive as 75% of folks drove alone to work, and that's the chart that's on the side. You can see um, that is a big piece. Uh, almost three quarters of the population that is driving to work are driving by themselves. There's a little bit of carpooling and a little bit of walking. Um, and obviously, this chart uh, will probably change as a result of all the changes we all just went through. Um, so it'll be interested uh, in a few years, the next time we have data that really can talk about how we've transformed, how we work. Um, the good also news, uh, kind of for Winona, 59% of commuters spend 14 minutes or less traveling to work, obviously, and if you're in a different type of community, that number looks different. Um, and so we, you are a compact city, and that's one of the elements that folks really talked about when we did the public engagement is just how the community is, how close everything is, and so whatever we can do to continue to support that. Uh, as we look uh, at the comprehensive plan. Um, there's not very many electric vehicles registered in the city and that just is something to think about as we think about greenhouse gas emissions and just how transportation will evolve into the future. So as we move um, from the kind of the background information, uh, I wanted to note before um, I kind of talked about some of the things to think about, the sustainability plan itself had six areas of focus, uh, energy, transportation, water, waste, natural resources, and food. Um, and so we didn't pull all of that information in today just because of our limited time. Um, but there is more information that would be helpful and relevant as we work through the different topics in the comprehensive plan. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. And if there's an area of focus that is particularly relevant to the work that you're doing, you may want to take a, a peek at what they had. There's more statistics. And as I said, there's um, goals and policies and strategies that are also helpful uh, and things that we can build upon. So if we look at example of how sustainability could be considered, we just put together some examples of other topics um, related to us that we see as we work through comprehensive planning. Uh, so in terms of parks, uh, looking at the proximity of parks to residents, the sidewalk and trail connections, how do we do, um, is all, are all of our parks in turf or can some of it be in native landscaping, which would be more environmentally sensitive? looking at strategies on integrated pest management, looking at strategies for edible gardens. And a lot of these things, just like uh, these overarching themes, they, taught, they kind of cover different topics. Uh, edible gardens is one thing folks have looked at for related to the equity topic as well. Um, so it kind of relates a few different areas. Relative to mobility, um, thinking environmentally, we're looking at things like transit access, uh, complete streets or living streets. So those um, are the ideas of, Streets shouldn't be just thought of in terms of uh, cars, that you're actually thinking beyond cars to all the different types of folks um, that could use a street. Uh, and living streets also is the idea of looking at stormwater integrated in it as well. So looking at bicyclists, transit, pedestrians, and cars. Um, and that's something that the city has done work in previously as well. Um, also related to environmental is how we handle pavement management. Uh, looking at alleys um, and how they are handled. Uh, in terms of economic development, the environmental sustainability would look at things like rede redevelopment of contaminated land, green building policies, compact development, and we'll talk a little bit more um, as we get into fiscal sustainability about compact development as it impacts both fiscal and environmental. Um, surface water, stormwater, BMPs, which is best management practices. There's new technology, kind of going back to the technology side, there's new technology uh, that folks can consider relative to stormwater, making sure we understand what those are and how they could be applied. Um, and then green alleys is the idea of alleys not just being pavement, um, but really incorporating other strategies so that it's not um, just contributing negatively to the overall impervious surface kind of throughout the city, all the paved areas. Uh, and solid waste and health um, isn't the, sorry, I just got, distracted for a second. Those aren't necessarily individual um, chapters of the comprehensive plan, but they're woven into other chapters, um, but certainly some things that we can think about, about healthy eating and active living, uh, food access, 
Uh, so those are some examples of how we could consider sustainability as we work through uh, the comprehensive plan. I did also want to note, just because not everybody's aware, oh, sorry, the next slide is perfect. Thanks. Um, there is a program uh, throughout the state of Minnesota called Green Step Cities. It's been around uh, for a number of years. I think it was 2015-ish that it was started. Um, and that program has more than, as I said, 175 actions and 29 best practices that are grouped into the five categories. So this is a great resource of like what could be done related to sustainability. Um, and it also is a great resource. Uh, it's something the community has already done. Uh, they've achieved step two, at least in the data that I could find online. Um, there's actually five steps. Um, as the communities keep achieving steps, they keep adding steps. Um, so there's more that communities can achieve. And it recognizes things that the city is also doing, but it also identifies new um, policies and actions that the city could undertake to move forward uh, and trying to green up the community. So this is a great resource as well um, for folks to be aware of if you're not already. So with that, I'm gonna take a quick pause. I know we were gonna pause at the end, but I still have a number of slides. So maybe just take a pause if that's okay on environmental before I dive into fiscal. If that's okay, Luke. That is perfectly okay. Are there any questions, comments, concerns at this point regarding environmental sustainability? And this is Carlos Espinosa, City Planner. We did have a comment from Sadie um, on the chat wondering if um, the sustainability plan working group could uh, do a presentation on things for each individual subcommittee to uh, address related to environmental sustainability. And I think the best way to address that would be uh, to put something together for each subcommittee so that when the subcommittees are creating their goals and objectives, um, they can have an eye toward some of the things that uh, you would like to highlight from the sustainability plan. So the answer is yes, uh, we can definitely incorporate that into the subcommittee work. Any other questions or comments? All right, with that, we'll keep going. Great. So the other half of sustainability is the fiscal. Um, there isn't a definition. The city doesn't have a fiscal sustainability plan. Uh, so we pulled some examples of what that could be as we look forward. So the idea of balancing its financial obligations with available or projected revenue streams, making sure that we're maintaining high quality services and well-maintained infrastructure for everyone and, and long into the future, um, uh, not sacrificing maintenance or of existing access over assets over the exist cost of extending infrastructure. I know that when we talk about development, a lot of focus is main on the new infrastructure and the expansion, but I think the fiscal sustainability is really looking at how are we making sure that we're maintaining our assets and we can grow thoughtfully over time. And that's why it is an important element of sustainability and something that was really a focus uh, of the comprehensive plan development. So some um, considerations of fiscal sustainability, the things that go into that, uh, and the next slide include expenditures or costs. So how much does it cost to extend infrastructure? How much does it cost to serve it? A lot of times when we think about development, we just figure, think about it's gonna cost a million dollars to extend the utilities for a mile, but that doesn't take into account the services, the actual provision of the utilities, the maintenance that's required. Um, other considerations are the demographics uh, and economic factors. Of who's involved and how much uh, density is involved and what are the economics of the folks and the businesses uh, that you're serving. The level of service, some communities make adjustments for the level of service over time. So we might um, provide high quality services and find that that isn't achievable in all areas and so have to make adjustments. Uh, risk management is making sure that we understand the potential risks, especially these days if we, as we talk about resiliency, uh, climate change, mitigation, so making sure we understand how the climate is changing and how do we need to adjust for those risks. Um, and then revenues, tax revenues, user fees, looking at different ways that we can uh, collect and make the revenues to meet the expenses that we anticipate for the future. So when we look at fiscal sustainability, um, it's really important. I tried to highlight it in the environmental that the city is really landlocked. There's really not a lot of space to expand. Uh, we have the bluffs constraining us, the river, and then um, obviously the cities. 
uh, and townships surrounding us. So that's something that we need to think about. Uh, there is also uh, really important to recognize the resource that we have in our existing traditional street grid pattern. It means moving through the community is really easy and convenient. As you can imagine, if you think about driving up to the bluffs and reaching those neighborhoods, there's not as many options. And so every, it doesn't have the convenience if you want to reach different areas of the community. Um, so as we think about the grid pattern, uh, it is something that we want to think about continuing into the future. Uh, and then it's also important to acknowledge that growth, when we say we, the city wants to grow, it's not necessarily an expansion of the city's boundary. There are also opportunities um, for infill development, reuse and redevelopment with existing properties, expanding housing choice. And so that's a few things that we wanted to cover is kind of how that might look or why we might be looking at that um, into the future. I'm gonna start a little bit on compact development uh, and Carlos is gonna take over shortly to talk about just housing choice and how that factors in. Uh, development in already developed areas is more efficient, um, as you can imagine, with terms of land consumption, but it also affects municipal utilities, services, infrastructure. So if you actually develop, redevelop in the same area, you've already put the infrastructure investment there um, so that costs less, um, to, for roads and trails and parks. The services cost less because you don't have to travel as far in order to provide the services. Um, it actually results in increased property values and tax revenues um, because you're more efficiently using the same amount of land. Um, one way to think about it is as you think about how far it takes, uh, if you have, I'm just going to take really suburban examples that you aren't matching, but I don't have a lot of, but if you took a hundred feet um, that you have to travel, across for every house um, and you only have to travel across 50 feet, you can understand that it takes a lot less effort and cost um, if we kind of make things more compact uh, than less compact. It also better protects the natural environment and that is uh, one of the reasons we wanna start with that environmental and that awareness of the environment of the community as we work into talking about housing and economic development and land use. So in terms of understanding residential density, um, the density of residential development, so things like I just referenced, the lot area, the lot width, um, they have impacts for infrastructure and services. So some examples of that, um, vehicle miles traveled per person decreases as lot size decreases. Uh, it also, uh, as lot size decreases, people are uh, much more able to walk to different locations, especially if you use the grid pattern that we had referenced. Uh, because you just don't have to travel as far to reach your destination, so you have different options. Uh, water consumption per home decreases as lot size decreases. Um, part of that is just the size of the home, and part of it is the number of people um, in that same area. Uh, and so one other element that when we look at um, doing calculations is we have to be aware of the fact that it's not just the property value per home, um, but if you look at property value per acre, that better accounts uh, for how many housing, houses are in the same area or how many people are living in the same area. Um, so density of development is something that we know um, is the conversations we're going to have are different than the existing patterns today. Um, so that's something that we want to kind of give you a preview about so we can keep that in mind. People's preferences, uh, when we look at studies, uh, are generally people are preferring walkable communities and those types of housing as opposed to just large lot homes and driving dependency. That doesn't mean there isn't a segment of the community that doesn't want that. Uh, but in general, when we look at location preferences for where people wanna live, they talk a lot about being walkable, their connections to parks, uh, their connections to open spaces, their connection to be where they can socialize with folks. Um, and that's one thing that you saw even from our pandemic is when people had the choice, there's a lot of people that moved around and really focused on where they wanted to live and being in a great environment as opposed to necessarily being close to work. So when given the choice, people are really focusing on the neighborhoods and the walkable communities. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind and that helps the fiscal sustainability of the community. Uh, also, there's a, sometimes a disconnect between market demand and the supply of various housing types. Um, and that's one thing that right now there might be just a familiarity with a certain type of housing. Um, but as we look at opportunities to kind of vary and provide different supply, there may be folks are interested, but the supply isn't there for the type of housing that they would want. 
we wanted to talk about housing choice in particular, just because we wanted to talk about the existing character of the community. So Carlos is going to take over and talk about this element um, for me. And thank you, Rita. Uh, again, my name is Carlos Espinosa, city planner. Uh, good afternoon now, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, in terms of the fiscal sustainability, one thing that we'll be taking a close look at related to the comprehensive plan is housing choice. And that's primarily because the predominant uh, residential land use in the city today is single family detached. It's not a bad thing per se, um, but what it doesn't allow for is uh, a number of different housing styles and a number of different housing units to meet the demand for additional housing in the city of Winona. And that predominant land use that we have today uh, is despite our traditional uh, city zoning and the core area, the R2 zoning, which allows one to four dwelling units per parcel in the center area of the city. Also the residential area south of Highway 61 is virtually all single family, either detached or twin homes. And we think both of these areas uh, represent a tremendous opportunity for allowing additional housing types in the one to four unit per parcel range. And really the key with taking a look at housing choice is how can you introduce new units to existing areas while maintaining uh, neighborhood characteristics? So how can you add more housing choice while balancing that out with maintaining the character of the neighborhood at the same time? Here's a map that uh, zooms in on the uh, loca location of single family, medium density and high density housing in the city. Um, in general, the yellow color shows all of the uh, single family housing opportunities in the core area of the city. And you can see the uh, difference between the predominant single family use and the uh, less uh, predominant medium density and high density uh, housing options in the core area. If you overlay our current zoning district, which again, this is the R2 zoning district, which allows one to four family uh, units per parcel. This is getting in the weeds a little bit, but it really is key to allowing more housing choice in the city. You can see that there's a broad swath of the city that according to our current regulations, you could have up to four units um, on a parcel. Um, but even though that zoning exists, uh, the predominant land use is single family. So what that represents to us is a tremendous opportunity to introduce uh, additional housing choice, not only into the core of our community, um, but other areas as well. So in terms of uh, housing choices, um, you know, we want to take a look at things that are good for Winona and that fit uh, Winona. Um, so taking a look at things like accessory dwelling units uh, or carriage houses, uh, as they have historically uh, been known. Other things such as owner-occupied structures, so owner-occupied duplexes, triplexes. Can a family um, purchase a single family now, a single family property now, add another unit and be able to afford the overall mortgage and the overall housing cost uh, because they have an additional unit that's attached and maybe a family member could live there or they could rent it out, but you're still maintaining the character of the neighborhood with that owner occupied presence yet adding additional housing choice to the mix as well. Also live work setups and re-legalizing this small scale, truly neighborhood commercial uses uh, that currently exist. Uh, you know, a favorite example, a, a lot of the neighborhood bars, Bladel Bakery, for instance, uh, you know, some of the old grocery stores that we used to have, uh, you have the commercial bones that used to be there and whether or not they're used uh, right now for that same type of use, it's still important for us to kind of re-legalize what makes Winona, Winona and also small apartment buildings, um, having something that is uh, an option uh, between a single family home type setup and a larger apartment complex. We think that we can integrate small apartment buildings into key areas of the city. Here's just some examples. Um, you know, these houses are not in Winona, um, but an exam some examples trying to show how, for instance, in the upper left-hand corner is a duplex. Um, and, you know, really you think something like that could fit um, pretty easily into our current urban fabric. And then some other examples as well, um, you know, something like a bungalow court, uh, which is on the lower right hand side where you have a number of uh, homes around kind of a more common area. Just some different options that are out there uh, for us to be able to take a look at increasing housing choice. 
and some other options uh, as well as this. But the housing uh, subcommittee uh, that's part of this comprehensive plan will take a deep dive into this. And really it's important for us uh, to be able to focus on this moving forward. So with that, I'll ask if there are any questions and comments. Um, Sam. You know, we addressed you know, the type of housing. What about home ownership? You know, because of the landlord plaque requirement, you can walk around town and see a massive amount of homes, even not college homes, they're renter homes. And I get that's kind of an entry to at least have a home, but you know, is that sustainable for you know redevelopment if that doesn't have generally a upward mobile uh, trajectory for that? Yeah, so the question was about uh, owner-occupied properties uh, versus non-owner-occupied properties. And I think what we'll be taking a look at specifically with a comprehensive plan is uh, trends in terms of student population, in terms of transitioning um, maybe student houses right now into uh, owner-occupied houses, what are options and obstacles uh, for that. But definitely, uh, we will be taking a look at that uh, as part of this plan. There is also um, a couple notes in the chat that I am going to address right now. And just a notation that um, from Nick Lemmer that we do have to consider federal and state grants and fiscal sustainability. And I would agree on that as well. Any other comments, questions? Yeah. Mr. Young. Carlos, thank you. I was really glad to hear the emphasis on, on housing. And housing really important for, for our future and uh, future went on. Uh, I heard a passing reference uh, to the word growth. I think uh, I, I've spoken on this before how, how uh, uh, important growth is for us. But Winona has been slightly shrinking the uh, past few years. And if, if, that, if we project that out uh, uh, 10 and 20 years from now, that would really become a challenge for us. So I'm hoping to hear more about, about uh, our ability to grow, where we think we can grow. Uh, something I did not hear about at all is, is uh, um, business and jobs. If we, want, if we want to grow, if we want people to live, where are they going to work? How, how, how will industry be able to, to reinvest and, and reinvent itself? So I'm, I'm hoping as we, as we um, move along here that we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll hear more about businesses and, and jobs and how they fit in <laughs> they're critical for, for our community so I'm, I'm hoping we hear more about that and the comment was um, just to hear more about business and jobs and the importance of economic development and that is a key component uh, of the plan not only is there an economic development subcommittee that'll be focusing on just that but um, our vision and values which was not part of this presentation um, the importance of our industrial heritage and entrepreneurship in our community are uh, for, at the forefront in our vision and values as well so not only in the values but also in kind of the the um, nuts and bolts of the plan uh, will both of those things come through? Can you uh, account for uh, apartments here? Can, you know that? Can we uh, account for apartments? Yes. Um, and that's something that we'll be taking a look at with uh, a housing subcommittee, definitely. Condominiums. And condominiums, yes. Yeah. Condos. Make an apartment, a condo, and a house in your, in your own Exactly. So what are the options in terms of if you were to take a single family home and create another condo out, at, uh, out of that uh, condo, condominiumizing, essentially? Um, and that's uh, one option for housing choice. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It, it does. I, I think that we could definitely take a look at it in the comp plan and see if there's other opportunities for it. So. Versus right now, what we're growth limited by the availability of employees and housing and sustainability. So whatever Winona has to offer as a brand it needs to shine so we can bring that talent and you know even redevelop our people in addition to our houses to get to that point. Definitely. And San's comment is basically bringing out that uh, what makes Winona, Winona, and uh, making sure that uh, we um, invest in that in the future. And that's what this plan is all about. 
Um, also in the chat, we have a comment from Brian wondering if we have access to future demographic projections. And yes, every subcommittee, um, that's part of uh, the underlying baseline information um, that we'll be providing you with moving forward here. Okay, and that brings us to 1230. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and we'll be seeing a lot of you in the future. Have a good one.